Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as together we study 1 Nephi chapters 11 to 15. I want to summarize just starting up, up front some of the words that describe the fruit that Lehi sees and then Nephi sees and kind of adds on. Going back with Lehi, there are words that describe the fruit like uh, happy. The fruit makes you happy, Verse chapter 8, verse 10. It's sweet in verse 11. It's white in verse 11. It's labeled as desirable in verse 12. And then Nephi adds a few more words on as he's having this experience. Beautiful. The fruit's beautiful. It's precious, verse 9. And he's kind of as a summary. It's the most desirable above all things. And that's like, that's like Nephi saying, here's my summary of how I would describe it. And I think I just, in my mind, I see the angel who's there saying, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, you're right. But let me just build on to what you say so you more fully understand what you're really seeing here, what this is symbolic of. Because the next verse, the angel adds on, it's most joyous to the soul. And we get a summary in chapter 15, verse 36, that it's the greatest of all the gifts of God. I love the way Sister Susan Porter just summarizes all about the love of God, how it is one of the greatest of all the gifts of God. When you know and understand how completely you are loved as a child of God, it changes everything. And we can get examples of that love of God, and we can, we can start with some of the greatest, the plan of salvation, the atonement of Jesus Christ. And the list would probably go on and on. But I want to just tie one additional thing in from Alma 32 where it's going to refer back to this tree of life and its fruit, which is most beautiful and most joyous and most desirable and the greatest gift of God. And so going to Alma 32, or 32, yeah, verses 40 to 43. Going up to this, you have, you have this seed, the analogy, it's planted, it grows up, and then you get this tree, and then you get fruit on the tree. And then you get this verse, uh, chapter 32, verse 40. And thus, if you will not nourish the word, looking forward with an eye to the fruit thereof, ye can never pluck of, we're back to, 1 Nephi 8 and 1 Nephi 11, the fruit of the tree of life. It seems that, you know, in the background, this is one of those visions that is just um, a part of the Nephite culture, and they're referring to it. That's the way I kind of see it. Because here's a culmination of Alma 32, and you're going to get, pluck, and eat the, the fruit of the tree of life. And verse 41, there's some reminders. You get it in 40, you get it in 41, you get it in 42. You need to nourish the word. Yay. Going to add this on, verse 41. Nourish the tree beginning to grow. You got to have faith. You got to have some diligence. You got to be patient. You got to have this perspective the way God sees it. And the tree is going to come up. Now, skipping to verse 42. And because of your diligence and your faith and your patience with the word in nourishing it, hey, let's just repeat the same thing three times so you get it. Do your part and God will do his. Keep nourishing it. Now, back to verse 42. It may take root in you. And behold, by and by, Ye shall pluck of the fruit thereof. And then you get these same descriptions, descriptive words that Lehi uses and Nephi uses. It is most precious, sweet above all that's sweet, white above all that's white, pure above all that's pure. This is an opportunity to you to feel and experience God's love. Well, there are major symbols in this uh, vision that Nephi sees in our reading this week. Let me just talk about a couple of the major ones. Uh, you have the rod of rod of iron or the word of God. And I kind of see it as multiple purposes. This is just my own word. Number one, it, it's going to keep you out of the river. And it leads you in a direction. It is leading you to the love of God, to the tree of life, back to the presence of the Father. And it helps keep you on the straight and narrow. You have another major symbol, the, the tree itself, love of God. You have another symbol that uh, is the mists of darkness. And the mists of darkness is described in chapter 12, verse 17, where it reads, And the mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil, first and foremost. Second, 
Oh, wait, before I go on, it blinds the eyes. Temptations allow you not to see and not to feel. Hardens your heart. You might not see what's really out there, see as things really are, but you don't feel it by the Spirit to understand it. Hardens your hearts. And it leads them away to broad roads. They perish and are lost. So, mists of darkness, temptations of the devil, hardens hearts. And then I'm just kind of generalizing. It's trying to kind of make sure that you don't see the danger out there. You're obscuring the danger. I don't think if somebody saw a path, they said, oh, I'm going down that path, and oh, and then it stops there and it goes off a cliff, that people would say, oh, I'm going to take the path. The mists of darkness are obscuring it so people are perishing and they're lost. So anyway, mists of darkness obscures a danger and uh, encourages you, I guess, to get, get lost. The fourth major symbol is the great and spacious building. <clears throat> now, Nephi, in these chapters in our reading this week, have three examples um, of the major symbols, and Nephi kind of identifies them, and we go through it. So, okay, here's the four symbols. Now I'm going to give you three examples of how this applies to us. And it goes through time frames, and you kind of see it through time frames, and there's a lot of repetition how these symbols apply to us today. Now, Nephi's given three, and I'm going to add a fourth. Okay, so four examples. Let's do the first one together. And you can tell on the left-hand side, I have the major symbols. And I spaced it a little different just because it's going to work as I'm teaching through it. So example number one, to the Jewish people. You have the example that there is the Word of God among them. And there's three examples. John the Baptist, 11 verse 27. Christ himself as an example of one who gives the Word of God. And his apostles. And in all three, they're going to help lead you back to the presence of the Father, to the love of God, to keep you on the straight and narrow, they're going to keep you out of danger, out of the river. Second, you have the example of the love of God. And Nephi's shown this. Hey, Mary is going to be an example of God's love. Christ himself, a great example of God's love. So once again, you, you have the symbolism, but now let me put it in real world application so you can... The repetition is going to help you understand how this applies to us today. You get the mists of darkness. Well, you have people fighting against the apostles in verse 34. And two, you know, to get people obscuring the danger, harden their heart, blind their eyes. And you have examples of great and spacious building. And for him, he calls it out. Chapter 11, verse 35, pride. And you can see it among a people. So, second example, um, and he says to look at it. Now, second example, you got the Nephites. You're going to serve as example number two in chapter 12. And they get, and I'm not going to go through this quite as much, but they have the word of God. They have examples of the love of God, the mists of darkness, and the great and spacious building. Third example, I know I'm going fast because this is a whole other chapter, the Gentiles. Hey, we're, we're going to start now shifting to our time frame as a third example of how you can see the rod, the word of God. And he says, like chapter 13, verse 35, uh, these things, an example of the word of God is the Book of Mormon. You get in verse 39, other books. You know, th th that could be like Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith Translation. Okay, other books that are the word of God, maybe written by apostles and prophets. And you get a third example in verse 39, the records of the prophets and the 12 apostles of the Lamb of God, New Testament. Okay, you get three more examples <clears throat> in chapters 13 of the Word of God. Well, you get more examples from the Gentiles of the love of God and the mists of darkness and the great and spacious building. But as I'm teaching this, I would kind of do the first one together and I'll maybe put them in groups and, and we'll just kind of list these up and kind of see commonalities, repeat, repeat, repeat. But my emphasis would really be my fourth example, my life. And this is where I really hope that in, in at least for me in my study or in, in a classroom setting, how do we see this in, in my life? So the word of God that we get, and we just had a bunch of examples and, and Book of Mormon would be an obvious one or the words of apostles, modern day apostles in general conference. How are we getting the word of God into us? How is it keeping us out of the rivers? 
how is it leading us back to God? How is it? How does the Word of God help us to feel God's love? How's the Word of God today helping me stay on that straight and narrow? And so that would be a part of what what I'd be asking. And I I just say, hey, would you write them some things out? How is it doing that? Keeping you feeling God's love, keeping you on straight and narrow, keeping you out of the out of danger, and maybe write that down. And maybe as for me, it's just that this another reminder just to, if you want to stay on the straight and narrow, be in the Word of God. If you want to feel that love, be in the Word of God. If you want to feel that love, and this is the second one, you get the tree, the love of God. How are you feeling God's love today? Are you feeling it? And we've got a lot of examples. And maybe some, I don't feel like that love today. And then you start thinking, well, one of the examples was Christ. Has he shown his love for it? You get all these examples of how God has really showing his love, has shown and is showing today. And then you can have a great, just in, in your life and just thinking about, all right, the mists of darkness around me. What is it that's, that's trying to blind our eyes in society today? What is it that people are saying or posting or, you know, adding with a meme what are the temptations that, that was easily beset us that maybe want to harden our heart what is it that's trying out to obscure spiritual danger those are today's mists of darkness the purposes of mists of darkness doesn't change the tactics change for sure and then we could talk about hey great and spacious building members and uh how's that pride How's that mocking, that scoffing? How, how, how do you kind of see that today in your life? And then back to, okay, we have the love of God and we can feel it getting closer to Him. Let's keep a hold of the Word of God. There's also some fortifications that Nephi mentions that God's given us, particularly in our days. So in chapter 13, verse 23, And he saith, it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew. And I, Nephi, beheld that he said unto me, The book that thou beholdest is the record of the Jews. One of the, per, one of the fortifications we have spiritually against these, the mocking, the miss, is the Bible. And I love the Bible. I had a record of Jews, and I'm going to continue on, and it contains the covenants of the Lord. It contains the prophecies of the Lord. And then just make sure you didn't miss it the first time. He comes back, hey, it contains the covenants of the Lord. There's some importance that he says this covenants fortify us against the evils of our day. And in verse 39 and 40, you get a couple more fortifications. And it came to pass, I beheld other books. It came forth, you got to know, they're by the power of the Lamb. So we're, we're getting this, we got the Bible, so now we're getting Book of Mormon, uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Pearl Great Price. And their purpose is to convince the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. That the records of the prophets, 12 apostles, the end of verse 13, are true. And then he says, hey, verse 40, I know I'm going kind of quick on this, but th these records, Book of Mormon, last records which shall see among Gentiles, shall establish the truth. A truth, truth is a fortification in our day. It fortifies us against the, the strategies and tactics of Satan. So, so these books will establish the truth that's in the first, the things the 12 apostles said. And it's going to help everybody know, major focus, we're going to teach about that he is the Lamb of God, that he is the Son of God, he is the Savior of the world. And everyone is invited to come to him. Coming to Christ is a fortification against the evils of our days. And in chapter 14, verse 1, And it come to pass that the Gentiles shall hearken unto, major fortification of our day is Jesus Christ. Gentiles in our day, if you hearken to him, if you listen and act on his words, he will promises to manifest himself to us in word, power, deed. So you'll get the word of God, You'll feel that power and help you act. And as you do that, it takes away the stumbling blocks, the difficulties doctrinally, the things that would help us, that would make us spiritually stumble and fall. And in chapter 14, verse 7, another fortification for our day. For the time cometh when the Lamb of God, saith the Lamb of God, that I will have 
a great work, a great and marvelous work among the children of men. A work will be everlasting. This work is going to help people convince them to go towards Christ and life and peace. And if not, it's not as good. Blindness and captivity, the captivity of the devil. That great and marvelous work is often talked about as the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our days, restoration of fullness of truth, the restoration of authority. And we also get in chapter 14, verse 14, another fortification for our day. Came to pass I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God. Once again, it all focuses around Jesus Christ. And one of the fortifications that it, the power of the Lamb of God, the power of Christ, descends upon the saints of the church of the Lamb. One of the great fortifications of our day is the church of Jesus Christ. It is there to be able to help us feel that power and... The next part, when we come back to, once again, the covenants. As being a part of the church of the Lamb, you become a part of the covenant people of the Lord. And as a result, Christ shares that power with us. And the end of verse 14, you become armed with righteousness and with power of God in great glory. And Elder Bednar has a great quote that just explains how we are armed with righteousness, the power of God, in our day. Elder Bednar said, The phrase armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory is not simply a nice idea or an example of beautiful scriptorial language. Rather, these blessings are readily evident in the lives of countless Latter-day Saint disciples of the Lord. I testify that the covenant people of the Lord today indeed are armed with righteousness and with power of God in great glory. I have witnessed faith courage, perspective, persistence, and joy that extends far beyond mortal capacity, and that only God could provide. Now, Nephi in the vision gives us a front row seat of some major historical events that have happened in the last 500 years. As President Nelson taught, we have front row seats to witness live what the prophet Nephi saw only in vision. You, my brothers and sisters, are among those men, women, and children whom Nephi saw. Think of that. See, so it's like the last 500 years, and then it gets to, to our days. And it's really, really kind of cool. And in his vision, Nephi talks about <clears throat> two churches. And sometimes people say, oh, the really churches like buildings. That is not what the scriptures indicate. Um, in chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, it came to pass that he said unto me, look, and behold that great and abominable church, which is the mother of abominations, whose founder is the devil. And he said unto me, behold, there are saved two churches only. One is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb, belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. President uh, Don H. Oaks said, The great and abominable church described by Nephi must be any philosophy or organization that opposes belief in God. And the captivity into which this church seeks to bring the saints will not be so much physical confinement as the captivity of false ideas. He concludes this vision by seeing the twelve apostles, and particularly one in particular. And the angel said unto me, this is chapter 14, verse 20, Behold, one of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, behold, he shall see and write the remainder of these things. Yea, and also many things which have been, and he shall also write concerning the end of the world. This is John the Revelator, and referring to the book of Revelations. As Nephi concludes and sees this marvelous vision, he's overwhelmed. He sees the destruction of his people. And as he comes back, um, he sees, well, it comes back to the tent. We'll get a picture of a tent here. Verse Chapter 15, verse 1. It came to pass after I, Nephi, had been carried away in the Spirit, and seeing all these things, I returned to the tent of my father, and it came to pass that I beheld my brethren. They were disputing one another concerning the things which my father had spoken unto them. For he truly spake many things unto them, which were hard to be understood, save a man should inquire of the Lord. And they, being hard in their hearts, therefore they did not look unto God, for the, unto the Lord, as they ought. And then Nephi, you know, he goes in, you, you know the story, goes in the tent, has a moment. And he needed a moment. And he comes out, approaches his brothers, and asks one of the most inspired questions of the Book of Mormon. Have ye inquired of the Lord? There is no message that appears in the scriptures more times, in more ways, 
then ask and you shall receive. Maybe that's the, the, the great thought for our day. It's Nephi's question for all of us. Have you inquired of the Lord? And I have seen in with President Russell M. Nelson's, I don't say tenure, but his time as a prophet, that's been an emphasis. Will you inquire of the Lord? Will you find out for yourself? It's good that we have the Word of God and good that we have the, have the, the love of God. It's there. But you need to experience and feel yourself. Hey, thanks for spending some time together with me today. I would love your comments or thoughts or suggestions if you want to add those uh, to the YouTube videos. Thanks. And I also appreciate got a couple questions that I answered. And also, I've got uh, my X account, formerly Twitter. You can find me. It's at brother at bro Miller's Notes. And uh, thanks so much. If you want past videos of... Uh, you know, if you want to be studying ahead, you're welcome to. I've got the videos for the Come Follow Me study from four years ago at brothermiller.org, and then I post them here and um, post them there, and then I also include any quotes. Hopefully, it's easy for you to cut and paste and put in your scriptures or make use. Thanks for ha thanks for uh, being with me for a few minutes today. Have a great day. Keep smiling.